Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Times and this episode of History As It Happens, a podcast for people who want to think about current events historically. I'm Martin DeCaro, and with us today, Michael Kazin, historian of Georgetown University. It's good to see you. Great to have you. you good, good to have you. Good to be here. Yes, that's right. And a <laughs> pandemic handshake. How about that? It's good. You've been on the podcast a couple of times before, and it's nice to see you in the flesh, finally. Same. I'm tired of Zoom, and we have a lot to talk about today. A book out March 1st. What It Took to Win, The History of the Democratic Party. Um, you've been a prolific scholar for decades now, writing about leftist political and social movements. What brought you to write uh, your magnum opus, maybe? Uh, the, <laughs> whole, the whole thing in one, in one small volume, smallish volume. Well, I've always been uh, intrigued by the history of the Democratic Party, partly because I've been involved yeah. as a canvasser, campaigner, um, um, arguer for the Democratic Party since I was uh, in grade school. In 1960, I came paying for John Kennedy in my little town, Englewood, New Jersey, outside of New York City. What's our handing out leaflets? And, yeah, handing out leaflets and wearing a big button the size of a little pot pie for Kennedy and Johnson. And um, I, I got away from the party for a while. I was a radical in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and felt that the Democratic Party was a corrupt party because they were prosecuting the war in Vietnam especially. But in the end, um, we have a two-party system, and one of the two choice. parties is going to win. And I was certainly on the side of the Democratic Party winning. Uh, so I gravitated back towards the Democratic Party. And as a historian, I noticed an unusual lack. That is, historians write about all kinds of subjects politically in America, but very few write about the major parties, you know, the history of the major parties. Maybe they write about it for one election, or one president, of course, or two presidents, or one controversy surrounding a party. But there's very few books um, on the whole history of either the Republican or the Democratic Party. So historians like to write about things that people haven't written about before, though obviously we use lots of books and documents by people who have written about it before. So this is an attempt to sort of sum up the whole history of the party, uh, what it stood for, uh, when it, and, and as the title has it, you know, when it was successful, and why? And so that was the theme. Now, when I saw your title, What It Took to Win, I thought of James Carville. As it turns out, you quote him early in the book, political parties exist to win elections. That's a debate going on right now about mm -hmm. how the Democratic Party needs to get its act together. We can eventually get to current events. But uh, by your own admission, a selective history, as I mentioned, it's a smaller, smallish volume. Nothing wrong with that. It does not have to be a 1,200-page book uh, uh, on, you know, uh, uh, to I don't like people. to write books that people aren't going to read. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> but it, it's a lot of material to get into one volume. You know, the party is basically the history of the Democratic Party is essentially a history of American politics. So when you say selective, what do you mean? As far as I try to understand. Um, how the Democratic Party put together a winning coalition um, based on interests, based on ideas, based on social movements, based on policy, of course, um, and how that coalition won at certain times, how it disintegrated, how Democrats built back a different kind of coalition very often, and how those coalitions, those ideas, those policies track larger themes in American history um, uh, as well. You know, expansion of the electorate, um, uh, the politics of industrialization and post-industrialization, um, ethnicity, race relations, racial conflict, uh, class conflict. So in many ways, the Democratic Party really, history of the Democratic Party, you can say, this is the history of American politics, yeah. you know, with, with, with sort of in half. So it's, it's a history of parties. Uh, as you mentioned, yes. disintegration twice, the party almost permanently ruptured. It, it managed to come back together after the Civil War, after the Civil Rights Revolution in the 1960s, the Dixiecrat Revolution, uh, Dixiecrat Convention in 1948. We're going to get to all of that, but you know, whenever I prepare for a, a podcast interview, I try to see if I have anything in common with my guest, and this is a stunning coincidence. We were both born in New York City. Imagine <laughs> that, right? Uh, two people. A small from, town. Yeah, small you know, town. We're from, the both from place. there. Yeah, yeah. You're a baby boomer. Sorry. Um, and I'm Generation X. You know, great note to start off talking about how old you are, but. Baby Boomer, you already mentioned you, you came of age politically in the 60s, handing out leaflets for Kennedy. Um, then you took a more radical turn in your politics. How did this inform your, your uh, journey to becoming a professional scholar who, as I mentioned, has been writing about this issue, multiple books for decades? A lot of historians write about you know, the distant past, write about other countries than the ones they're from. But 
For me, the main motivation for writing books of history, and most articles as well, is to figure out something that's happening politically in the present. You know? So I've written books about biography of William James Bryan, who we'll probably get to, you know, one of the, the great Democrats who ran for president three times uh, right. as a Democratic nominee. But I wrote that book when the, the Christian right was surging. And I wanted to understand what it was like when the leader of the Democratic Party was an evangelical Protestant Amazing. who believed in the literal truth of the Bible. Yeah. You know, and how that happened, for example. I wrote books about the American left, when the American left was in trouble, you know, uh, during the Bush administration, beginning of the Bush administration. So every book I've written has sort of been a way to understand the roots of a, a current political question that I want to answer. So you say in your book, uh, to be sure, my commitment to the Democrats is an ambivalent one, alloyed with regret and caution. The party's history is rife with missteps and outrages. Yet for all their, for all our faults. <laughs> so where's the scholarly detachment, Michael Kazin? <laughs> uh, I, I'm detached in the sense that I can explain why the party went wrong, often yeah. very wrong. Yes. Um, I'm kidding. At times before I was born and times when I was alive as well, yeah. you know. Um, but that doesn't mean that I think yeah. there's another political vehicle for progressive change in this country. It's powerful and as large as the Democratic Party, because there isn't. So that's, that's the bottom line on that part. I agree. You know? Currently, yeah. you're correct about that. Yeah. Uh, you say the Democrats remain the only electoral institution in 21st century America able and willing to help solve the serious problems facing the United States. So the history of the Democratic Party in one volume, why don't we start at the beginning? But that's even difficult to do because mm. for a long time, Thomas Jefferson, it would have been a surprise, to, he would have been surprised to hear this, was <laughs> considered the founder of the Democratic Party. Uh, this thing called Jeffersonian democracy is probably a construction he did not use. But you say that rests in part on a couple of myths that Jefferson really shouldn't be considered the founder of the Democratic Party. Why is that? Well, like most founding fathers, all founding fathers for that matter, Jefferson didn't like the idea of com competitive parties. You know? uh, he, he believed in what was called small R republicanism, that is, men of education and standing and property uh, who understood the, the virtues uh, of the Commonwealth should get together and make those laws, and they shouldn't have these factual disagreements. Um, so he obviously had his disagreements with Alexander Hamilton famously and, uh, and with John Adams. They ran against each other for president. But when Jefferson became president in 1801, he said, oh, basically, enough with this partisan party stuff. We should all be, he said in his inauguration speech in 1801, we're all Republicans, we're all Federalists, by which he meant we don't have any parties anymore. And he, in effect, he was saying we're all Republicans. That's right. Stop <laughs> yeah. criticizing me. Exactly. Yeah. And, and also, this was not a mass party, even when he had a party. It was exactly. really a collection of notables, I think I call it. I'm trying to remember the exact number of people who voted for president in 1800. It was about 50,000. You know, there are more people in the suburb of Bethesda, yes. north of Washington, D.C., twice as many uh, than there were voting for president, you know, for both candidates yeah. in 1800. The, the electorate was tiny. Even among yeah. those who could vote, most people didn't bother voting in national elections. And exactly. It, it was, the federal government was a distant thing. And most people couldn't vote because you had to have property, you had to be a white man, um, and you had to be, of course, over 21. Yeah. So... Sean Wilentz, a historian you're familiar with, uh, he, when it comes to Jefferson as founder of a party, I think you're right, there, it wasn't a party, but when it comes to small d Jeffersonian democracy, he argues that in a sense Jefferson was this, this founder. Against condescension and determined obstructionism, Jefferson and his party vindicated the political equality of the mass of American citizens, citizens in effect, laying the groundwork for the democratic reform that would come later with Jackson and Van Buren and, and others. Do you agree with that? I think that's true. Of course, there's a big except there. Yeah. And the big except is um, uh, African Americans. Yeah, everyone who wasn't a white male property. Most right? were slaves. Yes. But uh, no, certainly true. I mean, Jefferson famously said, you know, equal rights for all, special privileges to none. And uh, he was opposed to a strong central government, not for the reasons that conservatives today are, at least some conservatives today are, but because. Uh, he thought a strong central government would always be monopolized by the landed elite, uh, people like himself. And he thought that um, small farmers should, small white farmers should be the heart and soul of the country. And they were, of course, the majority at the time. And he was in favor of expanding the electorate to include people who didn't have property, even though that didn't happen very much during his own lifetime. What do we mean by mass political party? I mean, we today take for granted that all political parties, even in autocracies, need to appeal to, to public opinion. 
uh, mobilized publics or engaged publics, campaign rallies, party organization. But in the 1820s, if we want to date the, the formation of what was called the democracy to that time, mm -hmm. th that took a, a while to develop even then, right? When one, once, rather, the Democratic Party started to become a mass political party, right? Yeah, to be a mass party, you had to have a lot of the resources and elements that we, again, take for granted today. Democrats were the first mass political party, in the first political party in the world to have a press um, dedicated to the party, uh, not just in one city, but ma every major town and city in the country. Newspapers everywhere. Uh, they, had, they had regular conventions to nominate their candidates. Uh, they had a machine, that is, people to turn out the vote. Uh, they um, had... Uh, uh, agendas and policy agendas that they um, tried to discipline their elected officials to carry out. And also they were able to raise enough money uh, so that um, their uh, candidates would not have to dig into their own pockets uh, to pay for their own campaigns. So all these things we now take for granted. But the Democrats were the first political party in the world uh, to uh, institute all these, these changes. And, and they, also, of course, the fact that the electorate was growing, that by the 1830s, uh, the large majority of white men, whether they had property or not, could vote. It, constituencies were forming. People wanted a, more of a say in the mm -hmm. decisions that were taking place. And when we say people, we're still pretty much talking about white men here in the 1820s. But immigration was a huge factor. Immigrants were a major constituency, even as early as the 1820s, 1830s. Mm -hmm. The Irish coming to, coming to the United States, just to name one group, right? Yeah, that's one thing the Democrats were, were known for in their early days, and still are in many ways, I think. It's one of the continuities in the party's history. They were very open to immigrants coming in. Uh, they believed that the United States should be what Tom Paine called an asylum for all mankind. You know, they believed that it was important to welcome as many people as possible, um, um, free white people, uh, uh, to the United States. And, uh, and that included the Irish. Uh, and there was also uh, the fact that Democrats tended to be more uh, tolerant towards different religious groups uh, matter too, because most of the Irish who came, especially during the famine generation, were, were Catholic, of course. Um, and Democrats were often seen in the 19th century as the more pro-Catholic party compared to the Whigs and the Republicans. And as you say, they were the first not merely to acquiesce in the reality of competition, quoting from your book, What It Took to Win. Uh, they wanted to brawl, but when the Democrats are coming alive as a, as a party, as we would define it today, there weren't really other parties. We had the Virginia dynasty and kind of a period where national politics, for lack of a better term, seemed kind of dull when you hear <laughs> this. Oh, a Virginia planter aristocrat wins eight mm -hmm. years, eight years, eight years. But soon enough, there were competitive parties that saw what the Democrats were doing. doing. They were competing all over the country. As you said, they had newspapers all over the country, trying to win over new voters all over the country. It, was it the Whigs or were the first main competitors here? Yeah, this really, you know, the, the Democrats began this mass party in the 1820s. They were first called the Jackson Party because yeah. um, Andrew Jackson was their sort of charismatic leader. Um, um, but they also called themselves the democracy, as you mentioned, the People's Party Sorry. from Demos people. Um, but the Whigs began in the 1830s as the anti-Jackson party. Uh, they called themselves the Whigs because the Whigs in Great Britain uh, had been the faction uh, in the British House of Commons which opposed uh, the absolute powers of the king. Um, so the Whigs said, well, this guy Jackson, he's throwing his weight around. He thinks he's better than everybody else. Uh, he's taking on dictatorial powers. Um, he's, he's, called, he's King Andrew the First. Well, we're going to be the Whigs to oppose King Andrew the First. And the Whigs then also um, uh, uh, imitate a lot of the uh, uh, initiatives, the innovations in politics that the Democrats had begun. They have their own press. They have their own mass rallies with torchlights and elsewhere. They have their own barbecues and give out yeah. free liquor and so forth. The, the, so it's really, the two-party system as we know it is really born in the 1830s. But the candidates themselves probably weren't campaigning in person at this point, right? Oh, or, no, they were. Oh, they were? Okay. Not the presidential candidates. Okay, not presidential because, candidates. Okay. Because George Washington didn't campaign for himself, so that was the father of the country, uh, the greatest American, so to speak. You didn't, didn't want to do something he didn't do. The, the office was supposed to seek the man. But that wasn't true for, for people running for Congress, state legislature, mayor, uh, coroner and so forth. No, they campaigned for themselves. Yeah. You mentioned Jackson. I, I feel like we should bounce back a little bit between past and present. We don't sure. need to stick to a straight chronology, right? Uh, that might be That's difficult. That's boring history. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be difficult, too, in a, <laughs> in a relatively short conversation. We've, we've barely made it out of the 1820s. You mentioned Jackson. He and Jefferson are, how shall we say, 
somewhat falling out of favor with the modern Democratic Party insofar as honoring them. I don't think they call the, the Jefferson Jackson dinner or the Jackson dinner that anymore. They, they call it something else. Jefferson's statue was uh, taken down inside the New York City Council chambers because of his, his history of slave owning and all. Um, you make a reference to presentism. Early on in your book, you started, the ref you started to research your book when Donald Trump uh, won the election and that sent Democrats into a state of disarray. What are your thoughts on how the Democratic Party is, uh, well, let's start with the Jackson-Jefferson thing. These are two huge figures in the party's history, if you will, who are out of favor now. I guess that's not all that surprising. No, because more and more historians especially, and a lot of Americans too, are realizing how central slavery is to American history. You can argue about 1619 Project, whether they're correct about, about that or not. Um, but clearly, um, we had the most important event in American history, some would argue, is the Civil War. I would probably argue the Civil War. I would say, yeah. And the Civil War was, of course, about whether uh, a part of the country could break away to preserve slavery. So um, it's not surprising that two presidents who were uh, incredibly popular figures at the time, when they were president, when they were alive, but also were major slave owners um, and defended slavery. In fact, in Jackson's case, wanted to expand it uh, into the Western territories taken from Mexico. Uh, it's not surprising that uh, present-day Democrats in this multiracial, multicultural party are not going to be very you know, happy about celebrating Jackson or Jefferson. Yeah. I want to return to that point, but just briefly about you starting your research and Trump wins and Democrats are in a, a state of disarray. How did the present influence, at all, if at all, the way you approach this book? Uh, you know, partly I think it's, it was, I wanted to write the book because I wanted to understand how we got to this point. You know, as I mentioned before, I always start with a present question. But also, Democrats have always been a very heterogeneous party. They've always been a party which had to put together different constituencies, whether class or ethnicity or more in recent decades, race. Um, and that's always more to difficult. Win. To win. Yes. And the Republicans, I think, uh, it's fair to say, have usually been much more homogeneous. And sometimes if you're more homogeneous a party, it's easier to decide what you stand for. It's easier to know who you're going to appeal to primarily. It's easier to decide what policies you're going to pursue. Whereas with Democrats, it's more difficult. You know, one of the things I, I, I was on a, uh, a uh, conference, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, not exactly a podcast, with Tom Perez, uh, Tom Perez when he was uh, chair of the Democratic National Committee oh, right. back in 2017. DNC chair. And um, um, I asked, I asked uh, Tom Perez, I said, what does the Democrats stand for? And he sort of talked about values, uh, we have good organization, you know. I said, but that's not really <laughs> telling me what the Democrats stand That's for. Not, those aren't principles. Whereas Republicans, no. whether under uh, former President Trump or others, usually have a much easier time saying that. And this is not because Democrats are not very smart or, or not good at politics. It's because it's more difficult for Democrats to say what they stand for um, um, because they are such a, a heterogeneous party. Yeah, it's difficult to keep those types of coalitions together when you have people who say may disagree on social issues like abortion, but they may see eye to eye on labor issues right. or other issues. You know, about Jackson and Jefferson and slavery, well, one of the major arguments in your book are these competing tendencies. I want to get to this, let me get to it now. These competing tendencies that tell the story of the history of this party. Uh, you said the idea of liberty for African Americans posed a threat to his ambition, that would be uh, Jackson's, of creating a party that could win a majority in every region, or was that, that may have been Van Buren. Here I am quoting your book, and I forgot who that pronoun <laughs> is supposed to, but this idea that white liberty rested upon black, a lack of, of liberty and equality for African Americans, that was one of the ugly aspects of the party's history for quite a while. Yeah, and it's a good example, I think, of the, how difficult it was for Democrats to stay united, you know, um, for very long. They stayed remain one party, but often yeah. <laughs> different factions in that party who battle it with one another. Um, About civil rights. Because, for example, uh, in the 1840s and 50s, when the Democrats were the majority party in America, they were the majority party because they could put together the votes of most white Southerners, uh, both poor white Southerners and big planters, like Jackson, uh, and uh, newly arrived Irish Catholic uh, immigrants who came with nothing, w w with wearing, with wearing, uh, owning nothing but the clothes on their back, um, escaping famine, escaping, escaping death from hunger. Um, 
the fact that you had this mixture, you had both Jefferson Davis and Walt Whitman were devout Democrats in the 1840s, for example. You know, we don't think of them as the same, you know, the, the good, great, good gay and great poet and the, form, the future head of the Confederacy. Um, so the reason they, how they get, way to get together was they did agree that um, what people call the money power, the power of big banks, the power of Wall Street, uh, was um, something evil. Uh, it was a monopoly, a money monopoly, yes. which was trying to uh, have its way with uh, ordinary Americans, was sort of picking and choosing people who they'd invest in, depending on who their friends were. Uh, the Bank of the United States was a big issue there, and they, yeah, uh, we're gonna get the to Democrat that. Party opposed that. So that was one way in which they were able to unify. Yeah, so yeah. they were a national party, which was, which was a good thing, but they also were a national party, which you could see already had the, the elements of, of, of fragments in them. Yeah. Use the term moral capitalism when discussing the competing tendencies. And those two tendencies are anti-monopoly uh, in a 19th century context mm -hmm. and, and pro-labor once we get to the 20th century uh, with the progressive movement in the early 20th century, then on into the New Deal. Uh, what is moral capitalism and why does it matter to Democrats? Yeah, that's a term I use. I borrow from a friend of mine, uh, Liz Cohen, who teaches at Harvard, wrote a very good book about, about the New Deal. Make, called Making a New Deal. Yeah. And, <clears throat> Basically, it means that uh, the Democratic Party, when it was successful, uh, was known for standing for the economic interests of ordinary Americans, um, <clears throat> which uh, meant in the 19th century, small business people, small farmers. Uh, it was capitalism because most Americans did not want to um, you know, get away from a market system, uh, believe that if all things being equal, everyone has an equal chance to rise, what we later on call the American dream should be a reality. But they felt that certain elite interests were standing in the way. It's kind of economic populism, if you will. Um, and, and so the Democrats were pretty successful uh, in the 19th century at different times in putting forth this vision of moral capitalism and certain proposals, excuse me, to, um, uh, to, put, uh, to put teeth into it. Um, um, like a lower tower, for example, um, like uh, inflating the money supply to enable people to, to, to get interest rates down, to be yeah. more money in circulation. And that raised questions yeah. about the role of government early in the Republic. Exactly, because they felt the government, you know, as I said before, the government was likely uh, it had to have more power to want to help its friends, and as elite people in the government try to help its friends. So yeah. Democrats were opposed to a sort of large standing bureaucracy. They were opposed to government picking Picking, picking, you know, winners and losers, you know, uh, as we say today. Whereas the 20th century, you want me to get into that now? Yeah, in the 20th yeah, century, can, can uh, things begin to change. First, the labor movement begins to grow. Um, in, in World War I, it has 20% of the labor force. Uh, by uh, World War II, it's 35% of all um, wage earners are in labor unions. Um, well, today, it's like what, 6%? It's like 10%. Yeah, 10% in yeah. the private sector. Go yeah, 10% altogether. Oh, altogether. Um, 6% of the private sector. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so the movement puts pressure on Democrats, who have been more in favor in general terms of wage earners than the Republicans had. Um, but that often was just more rhetoric than anything else. And the labor movement said, if you want our votes, you've got to help us to um, get unions recognized. You've got to support a minimum wage, maximum hours, uh, protection for workers on the job, and so forth. Um, Funny how we're still fighting over those things today. We are. We are. <laughs> well, we have a minimum wage, but it hasn't gone up certain, much. Certain continuities, yes. <laughs> yeah. I know. They're... So you allude, we're going to bounce back and forth a bit. I think that's okay. Uh, you mentioned before the dispute over slavery. Of course, that was the most important dispute in the antibellum, antebellum United States by the 1850s. Of course, 1860, the country starts to split, maybe even before that. But the Whigs and the Democrats, to a great degree, wanted to keep slavery out of national politics so they could deal with other issues because if slavery reared its ugly head again, it would, well, potentially cause the fissure of the country, would prevent progress on other things. I mean, it's probably echoes in the 20th century when civil rights was shunted aside to form a consensus around other things like fighting the Cold War, maybe. You're the historian here, so you interject when I'm going when I'm going awry. But a Cold War is not quite true. I mean, okay. the Cold War actually was, ironically, perhaps a impetus to civil rights because right. the Soviet Union and its allies kept saying, "Look, these Americans talk about they're for freedom and democracy, right. but look what's happening in in uh, Montgomery, mm -hmm. Alabama. You know, yeah, they were, they uh, were Birmingham, like, Alabama. So, um, uh, so in, in effect, really, this civil rights." movement was able to use the term freedom to mean let's have real freedom and so we don't look so bad um, abroad in the competition with the Soviet Union. Thank you for that correction. Sure. You know, you know I, I'm not a historian and I don't play one on my podcast, but um, 
about the, the many issues that they were grappling with, uh, the fight over the second bank of the United States, I think, is a really telling episode of, uh, you know, to your argument about what did the Democratic Party stand for early on, this, this form of moral capitalism. Let's just start with a direct question. Why did King Andrew want to get rid of the second bank of the United States? Second Bank of the United States was a uh, very powerful institution. Uh, we don't have anything like it. Uh, it was a central bank, like the central banks you have in, in, uh, in Europe. But uh, it was run by a private board of, yes. um, uh, of executives uh, who were chosen pretty much by kind of Nicholas Biddle, who was the head yes. of the bank. It wasn't a government uh, entity. No, right? it was chartered by the government. Uh, but the government did not run it. And as I said before, it picked winners and losers. You know, it decided invest in, you know, this uh, shoe factory in Lynn, Massachusetts, maybe, which meant you're not going to invest in a different shoe factory somewhere in Upper New York State. Um, they also, at a time before the government um, printed money, uh, the, the Bank of the United States printed the currency that most people in the eastern part of the United States at least used um, when they used paper money. Um, and so it, felt, it was a sort of a... Uh, a a uh, political enterprise unto itself, unelected, uh, appointed only by people who ran the bank. And Jackson uh, believed that uh, this was against all the principles of democracy, as he, had, as he understood it. Um, also, the fact that it was in Philadelphia, in a very wealthy neighborhood. It just was, he was a, a poor boy from the Carolinas uh, who made his way up, and he, he didn't like the, uh, cult, he had a cultural antagonism towards the bank as well, I think. He held um, grudges, I heard, Andrew yeah, Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> often, often with a, a weapon in hand, yes. Um, he had several duels. Yeah. And, uh, and so um, when, when the Congress, which was controlled by, by people who become Whigs later on, voted to uh, recharter the second bank, it had to be rechartered every 20 years, but to recharter it, he vetoed that, and they could not muster uh, the two-thirds to override his veto. He said at one point to Martin Van Buren, who was his vice president and later successor, he said, the bank wants to kill me, I will kill the bank. <laughs> um, so you can see the rhetoric was uh, pretty raw back then. And the idea behind this was, unlike today where we've kind of forgotten that it's not, you know, the poor people who are the takers. And in, in those days, men like Jackson worried it was the wealthy and the powerful exactly. who were going to erode the foundations of democracy by taking from the lower classes or, or the concentration of wealth and power in an institution like the Second Bank of the United States was a threat to democracy. Very much We've so. kind of forgotten And that, that really, we flipped goes, that. It really continues into the yeah. late 19th century, yeah. early 20th century, when you have the anti-monopoly movement, yeah. antitrust movement, yeah. um, which is in both parties. But the Democrats are probably strongest in that because they're not really the big business party, um, which is a fear that a lot of Americans have, that um, uh, the government will be used to help private interests. And we still... Think about that today when, Absolutely. when, when uh, there's debates happening in Congress, at least right now, about whether uh, Congress people should be barred from making stock trades, you know, that they use their, their inside knowledge about what's going on um, in the economy to, to make money for themselves. I thought of Elizabeth Warren when reading that section of your book, who uh, campaigned on breaking up, potentially breaking up, or reigning in the power of right. pri large private institutions, whether they're banks, big tech, social media platforms. Uh, she would have fit right in. Well, you know, she may have had trouble as a woman running for office in the 1840s, but you know what she I mean. She couldn't vote, so yes, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she would have fit right in. Her ideas would have no, fit definitely. right in with Jackson's. Definitely. That, you know, this is a threat to the common person, whereas today, um, I mean, we could talk about the Reagan revolution and later on in the conversation and, and its challenge to the, the New Deal coalition and the Great Society, but kind of this... Um, almost mean-spirited approach to, 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 the, to the poor, almost blaming them for taking from, you know, welfare queens, right? They're, they're taking advantage of the system instead of looking at the powerful who are. Well, you know, there's an ongoing debate in American society, yeah. inside the Democratic Party, outside it as well, about whether poor people are, most poor people are poor because they just, they don't organize themselves yes. well, they don't, uh, you know, um, work hard, uh, they, they don't uh, get married, have babies without being married, they take drugs, et cetera, et cetera, get drunk too much, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or whether, even if their behavior is like that, whether uh, the structures of inequality in a yes. society um, make it very difficult for the people to get out of poverty, uh, yes. at least most people to get out of poverty. 
And we continue to have those debates today. We'll continue to have them probably for as long as we have a republic. Yeah, th thank you for saving me. There are structural problems in my uh, poorly worded. Uh, well, that wasn't even really a question. That was just a, a word salad that uh, <laughs> you made sense of. So Second Bank of the United States goes down. Uh, there were other, other issues that were important as well um, that uh, in, in addition to slavery, because right now we're very much focused in 20, what I mean right now, 2022, about the role of slavery in, in the American past. Of course it was important, but low tariffs, free immigration, taking from your book here, an end to prison for debtors, uh, sympathized with early labor unions against courts. I mean, some of these issues don't obtain anymore. We don't have debtors' prisons, although people are in debt for their entire lives. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren wants to do something about that as well, to use her example again. A fear of statism coupled with the creed of white supremacy also led Northern Democrats, you argue, to condemn abolitionists as dangerous meddlers of the rights of agrarian property owners. Maybe there's a good time to start transitioning into the, the, antibellum, the antebellum period here and, uh, and, and, the, and those convulsions within the Democratic Party. Sure. Well, you know, abolitionism was obviously a very radical idea mm -hmm. when it began, and abolitionist movement included blacks and whites. You know, uh, often we think of it's mostly people like William Lloyd Garrison and John Brown, others who are white, but black abolitionists, not just Frederick Douglass, many others are very active in it. But Democrats uh, who were as I said, almost completely a white party, and a party yes. that even people like Martin Van Buren, who didn't want to abolish slavery, uh, uh, who, 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 who uh, didn't want to abolish slavery, was critical of slavery, slavery expansion, but he, he was not an abolitionist, and did not sympathize with abolitionists. And Democrats tended, again, when they were the majority party, to call abolitionists, and people wanted women to vote, people wanted uh, the prohibition of alcohol. They, they had a common term for them. They called them fanatics. <laughs> um, there's a wonderful story I quote by, by, by Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the great novelist who was a Democrat, uh, who wrote a campaign biography of Franklin Pierce before he was elected president in 1852. Um, Anyone read it? <laughs> uh, about, uh, well, Democrats did. <laughs> uh, about um, sort of uh, a story where, where all these people gather in the countryside and throw all these uh, old cherished traditions into a bonfire, uh, including Bibles and lots of other uh, things. And, 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 uh, and Democrats believe that um, you wanted you know, poor folks' democracy, yes, but um, you didn't want to disrupt the whole social order you know, to get it. Uh, in fact, they often had a sense of sort of golden age thinking that before you know, when everybody was sort of an agrarian, then, then things would have been somewhat better. Um, <laughs> and and um, uh, good old and so abolitionists were clearly, first of all, abolitionists were, were evangelical Protestants, most of them. That meant that they, the Reformation hadn't really ended. You know, they really were opposed to Catholics. Not surprisingly, Catholics, especially Irish Catholics, said, well, if you don't like us, we don't like you either. And so that meant that Democrats, if they were going to be the party of Irish Catholics, which they were, were also going to be opposed to abolitionism. So there was some of what sociologists call a negative reference group uh, thinking going on there. But in general, again, the Democrats were very hard-headed also. They said, how are we going to win? How are we going to keep winning? Um, we're not going to win if we divide ourselves in the issue of slavery. We're not going to keep winning if we throw, throw over the white South, or for that matter, if we throw over um, people in the North who don't have slaves, don't want slaves, but also are afraid that if you abolish slavery, more black people will be free and come north and compete with white workers. Yeah, like they weren't Irish racial workers. equalitarians. Yeah, right. they sort of wanted, they wanted things to be sort of racially, sort of stay where they were. Well, um, Northern Democrats, 1850s, lead up to the Civil War. The antebellum United States. Every time I pronounce it anti, I want right. to um, you know, kick myself. It's Latin. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> antebellum United States. Um, Northern Democrats, would you say they were anti-slavery or they simply just, well, they were dough faces like James. Well, there was a split. Yeah. That's the point. Split, yeah. There was a split. You know, there were the Northern Democrats like David Wilmot, a uh, name should be better known, who uh, sponsored a resolution in Congress yeah, during proviso. the Mexican War, yeah. proviso, proviso, saying that any lands that were conquered from Mexico during the Mexican War would, uh, slavery would not be able to, you know, uh, be the law in those, in those territories, which later become states. Whereas, Presidents like Pierce, Buchanan, two Democrats elected in, in the 1850s, said, well, you know, if people want slavery in those territories, it's probably okay, and uh, we don't want to split the party up. And uh, the famous Dred, infamous Dred Scott decision, 1857, which argued that black people could not be citizens, went along with that thinking as well. Um, and so Democrats who were afraid of the power of 
the slave owners, who weren't necessarily in favor of abolishing slavery, but they were afraid of something they called the slave power. That is the idea that pro-slavery Democrats uh, were going to empower in the courts, in the Congress, in the presidency, would do the bidding of big slave owners in the South. Um, and they would basically take over the whole government and keep the whole government and do what they want with it. And that drove lots of Northern Democrats to oppose um, uh, the expansion of slavery and a lot to become Republicans as well. Sorry. Old Whigs, because slavery destroyed the Whigs and split the Democrats, right. but the, the Whigs exactly. are, go extinct because of slavery. Uh, Often today you'll hear the Democrats were the, were the party of slavery, and that was true by the, by the Civil War. The party, at least the southern part, was basically dedicated to preserving, Jefferson Davis was a Democratic senator, preserving this institution of slavery. After the war, and, and you mentioned this quite a bit in your book, and of course this is very much a present issue today, um, the promise of the Civil War, the promise of liberty was, was, was contradicted, was, well, the promise was reneged on because of how Southern Democrats treated freed people. Um, not immediately, there was the, the Reconstruction was actually had some impressive, of course that was the work of the radical Republicans. Which Democrats didn't go along yeah, with. Yeah, did not go along with. They fought it tooth and nail all the way. We had the first uh, Ku Klux not Klan. Not one Democrat voted for the 14th Amendment or the 15th Amendment. Not one. Not one. Okay, yeah, so, and they fought it. Uh, we had the Ku Klux Klan. And the party doesn't really get over this for a uh, 100 years. Hard to reconcile that, isn't it? I would argue. I would argue in the book something I think is uh, not most people don't realize that be Democrats begin to get over it in the 1930s. That's right. That's when Democrats yeah. start voting. I'm sorry. That's when black people start voting for Democrats. 1936, first, the first election, first yeah. presidential election, yeah. when most de most black voters vote for uh, the Democrats. Yes. Even then, most black people in the South could not vote yes, uh, that's yet because um, they were disenfranchised. But. What begins to happen is a couple of things. First of all, the Northern Democratic Party becomes, first under Woodrow Wilson, segregationist, but then, especially under, under Franklin Roosevelt, the party of liberal intellectuals who often sympathize with the left in Europe, uh, sometimes former socialists uh, as well. Um, and, and they are brought up in an environment which is in cities like New York, which is much more friendly towards, towards uh, uh, biracial culture, biracial institutions, public schools where people go, go to school, you know, cross racial lines and so forth. And also, very important, I think, is the union movement itself in the 1930s. The CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which was the union federation that's formed in the mid 1930s out of the older uh, American Federation of Labor, um, is dedicated from the first to signing up uh, members regardless of race. Um, Part for practical reasons, because Auto workers, steel workers, meatpacking workers, longshoremen, um, uh, tobacco pickers are both black and white. And if you only sign up the whites, <laughs> you're, the I black people can, can break strikes. You know? right, and, yeah. But also they believe in it, you know, partly because of their background of a lot of organizers in the left, I think, uh, the multiracial left. So, um, and as the CIO grows and labor as a whole uh, quintuples this membership from 1933 to 1945, from 3 million to 15 million members, it puts pressure on the Democrats uh, to accept uh, black people, not just as, well, they're voting for you because maybe they get jobs in a New Deal agency, but to, to argue that, that racism is wrong and that the legacy of the Democratic Party in terms of race should be abandoned. Um, so and that begins before the 1960s. Yeah. Woodrow Wilson was a progressive, so was Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. um, Woodrow Wilson was also, well, a white supremacist. That's yep. not unfair to call him that. His uh, father was a Confederate minister. <laughs> yes, uh, he was a racist. Um, he did not hide that as well. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt didn't really do much for civil rights either. I mean, that's another theme, as I mentioned in your book, this tension. But it, start, it does start to break yep. um, all, because there were other progressive developments in the country that, you know, that kind of... Uh, I guess these things, they kind of they help each other, right? Um, labor movement, as you mentioned, started to uh, include blacks and others. But by the time we reach the 1960s, we still have uh, many Southern Democrats who are, would, uh, or that's the hill they're going to die on. Mm -hmm. how, does, how, do, how does the Democratic Party, with Lyndon Johnson as president, finally get past that? Well, one could argue it never really did get past it. Yeah. Uh, it only got past it because most... Um, at least, to, at least in, to pass a couple of pieces of legislation. Oh, 64 yeah, yeah, and 65. Yeah. Well, 64 and 65, I mean. um, first of all, Democrats have huge majorities in both houses of Congress. Um, uh, 64, there are only, I'm trying to remember, I think 30 Republican senators, something like that. That's right. that <laughs> helps. 31. But also, uh, Northern Republicans, um, 
a majority of, not all by any means, but a majority of Northern Republicans in the House and, and the Senate vote for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Right. There's one bipartisan of things, support One of the things which Republicans today often point out yeah. is that yeah. a higher percentage of Republicans voted for those two bills, <laughs> these landmark civil rights bills, than Democrats, because so many Democrats were still from the South. Yes. But those bills, Lyndon Johnson famously said, after the Civil Rights Act of 64 was passed, I think we lost the South for a generation. And he was wrong. But it was more than one generation. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, that took time for it to become a solid South yeah. in the Republic. It took some yeah. time. Which is yeah. not quite as solid as it had been for the Democrats. Yeah, but, sorry. you know, and Bill Clinton, enough. as a Democrat, won several Southern states. And Jimmy Carter. Yeah, unfilmed. Of course, too. Yeah. Uh, he, was a con he was a conservative Democrat, would you say, Carter? Yeah, but he was not conservative on race. I mean, he That's was... Right. He was uh, he was for the civil rights movement. He had, you know, more black uh, appointees than any president in history before him, for example. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think what happened is uh, once the Democrats were perceived by a lot of white voters who were ambivalent about civil rights or maybe antagonistic towards it in the South, especially, but not just the South, it wasn't just a Southern problem, um, began to say, well, if the Democratic Party is really more for those black people than it is for us, and they began to feel maybe... Um, these uh, these liberals really, uh, you know, uh, are it's just this mo it's really just mostly a black party now or a party for minorities, um, and uh, and so they began often they often would keep voting for Democrats at the local level. That was true in the South for a long time and the state level too. Uh, but in, but for presidential elections uh, they would vote Republican. They'd vote for Nixon uh, in '68 and '72, and then Reagan, and then uh, both Bushes. LBJ had those big majorities, but he had to break a filibuster, didn't he, for voting rights? In 65, yep. he did have to break a filibuster. Oh, so both of them, actually. Yes, for both yeah. of them, yeah. uh, Hubert Humphrey, actually, uh, who was uh, in the Senate uh, in 64, and then he was vice president mm -hmm. by 65, was instrumental in doing that, too. I'm glad you brought up Hubert Humphrey. I just watched. Very few people do. Yeah. <laughs> good man. Here's a good Hubert. Yeah. Hubert Horatio Humphrey. <laughs> At the... So the two, the two huge uh, convulsions or fissures, the Democratic Party split before the Civil War. They actually ran two candidates in the, that presidential contest. 1860, yeah. 1860. There were four candidates. There was a constitutional union party in the South. Which is the former Whigs. Really. Yeah, former yeah. Whigs. Uh, with Lincoln, who wasn't even on the, uh, that was a rigged election. Lincoln was not on the, the ballot. <laughs> and then, of course, the 1948 Dixiecrat Convention. I mean, we're not even talking the 60s yet. Right. The, the Dixiecrats walk out or, or they, they form their own. I guess there was a walkout in the 60s. But in, in 48, they formed their own convention with Strom Thurmond. You can find this speech on YouTube as well. He gives this screeching white supremacist oration at the Dixie Crack Convention. I mentioned Hub Hubert Humphrey, also in 48. It's time, paraphrasing, to you know, walk out of the shadow of states' rights and into the sunlight of, of, human, of human rights. I mean, what a moment. And there. that's why they walked out. Yes. Because he was giving a talk. He was then mayor of Minneapolis, uh, and he was giving a talk at that convention in 1948 to support what was then a minority plank from the platform committee supporting the Civil Rights Bill. And the speech was so powerful and enough liberals, especially labor liberals, got behind it um, that the party as a whole did adopt it. And as soon as they adopted it, you know, a lot of the Southern Democrats saw the handwriting on the wall and they walked out. LBJ and his big majorities, FDR, I don't know if FDR had to overcome any filibusters. I don't know if the filibuster was used all that often in the 1930s. but. When you look at the Senate majorities during the New Deal years and you wonder, you know, how did FDR get this um, program through 65, 70, sometimes 75 Democratic senators? Now, some of those New Deal programs had to be amended. Unfortunately, to, to get them passed, black people were excluded uh, from some of them. Well, not specifically, but because yeah. you couldn't yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. But it was, but it was a, yeah, a right. domestic workers, yes. agriculture workers. That's right, who were mostly both black. From the civil, both, both from yes. the, the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations right. Act, which... Uh, how the government helped recognize unions when workers wanted it, and uh, the Social Security Act, yeah. too, which was so, everybody except those people yeah, that's uh, right. benefit from. Would you say the New Deal is really the, the greatest moment in the Democratic Party's history? Probably because it's the moment when the Democratic Party uh, is uh, more powerful, uh, is really the majority party, and nobody really doubts it, uh, and it also is able to get in the major bills uh, to create kind of limited, but real welfare state we still have. Moral um, capitalism, the word you use. Yeah, yeah, in that sense. But again, you know, some people said, well, Roosevelt saved capitalism uh, because, you know, after all, fascism was gaining in Europe, you know, uh, Italy, Spain, Germany, um, and, uh, and of course, the Soviet Union was, was powerful in, in Eastern Europe. And, and, and so, so the idea of, of democracy surviving, Roosevelt said, you know, 
uh, for democracy to survive, we have to make sure it serves the people. Sorry to interrupt. And some people in the United States, some conservatives, some people on the right, wanted FDR to assert near dictatorial powers because of the crisis of the Depression was so severe, but he resisted. He resisted, and of course he didn't need to because right. Democrats had, had Democrats. a big, big, big majority. You know? so, yeah. uh, 98 senators at one point, I think he did actually But one point I do want to make about that, yeah. it's okay, Martin. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. One of the hallmarks of New Deal policies, the one the most popular, and the ones that still exist today, mm -hmm. is that they're more universal. Yes. They didn't help one group of workers or one race specifically against yes. another. Now, it's not to say that the Civil Rights Bill wasn't necessary. It was. Yes. The Voting Rights Act wasn't necessary. It was. Open Housing Act, 1968, wasn't necessary. It was. But the most popular bills uh, that Democrats have passed historically, the ones that enable them to, to build you know, on and, or create majorities, are ones which, uh, which help the great majority of Americans, like Social Security, mm -hmm. like Medicare, which no Republican would think about uh, trying to appeal today. Yeah. Well, they think about it, but they're never going to get there yeah. because so many people benefit from it. Uh, Barry Goldwater, I think he wanted to get rid of Social Security, and we saw what happened to and him. George W. Bush wanted to privatize it, yes, but uh, they went nowhere. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Now, I think what the important things about the New Deal are the programs that endured. Yep. And a lot of the experimentation failed. Of course, the New Deal did not end the Great Depression, but that misses the point of the New Deal. It established security, predictability, uh, in uh, against the vicissitudes, a word that uh, David M. Kennedy uses in his great book about the New Deal, against the vicissitudes, yes. Yes, <laughs> of the vicissitudes of life in a capitalist society, you need a safety net, and that's what that what that's what endures to this day. So, who you know, to the point of your book, what it took to win the New Deal coalition was not a monolith. It was not ideologically pure. You had a lot of different groups from different parts of the country in there, right? In fact, the larger the coalition, the more heterogeneous it's going to be. Yeah. We're a big country, you know? And, that's that's uh, good. That's and right. if you have, you know, 65 senators, they're all not going to, in the same party, they're not all going to agree, you know? This is not the Bolshevik Party. Even the Bolshevik Party disagreed, but uh, uh, they didn't have democracy. But, but um, of course, you could also wind up in front of a firing yeah. squad. I mean, for, exa for example, the congressman named John Rankin from Mississippi, who was a major architect of the Tennessee Valley Authority, this big government program to build dams, provide electricity to people in the Lower South, which still operates today. It's government power, you know, uh, fairly cheap um, cost to people down there. And, you know, uh, he was an aggressive racist and anti-Semite. You know, he gives speech on the floor of the Congress talking about, I won't say the words, N-words and K-words, you know, uh, and uh, he was kind of sympathetic towards Hitler, at least until the war began. But at the same time, he, he knew he, uh, he wanted to extend, you know, electricity to small farmers who were his constituents. Uh, Lyndon Whereas Johnson as well. On the other side, there were, there were congresspeople uh, from uh, California and, and the state of Washington who um, we now know were, were probably members of the Communist Party. Uh, um, and, Wait, aren't and, they all communists? Uh, no, right, exactly. <laughs> and, and they, of course, ran as Democrats, yeah. and they didn't yeah. talk about being communists at the time. Yeah. Um, but so when you had someone who was a sort of proto-fascist on one hand, and maybe actually a member of the Communist Party on the other, both in the Democratic Party, that's a pretty broad coalition. Yeah. Uh, but again, Democrats only do what they could do because Dem the Republican Party had been so discredited by the Great Depression, um, the Hoovervilles and everything else, uh, and also because, you know, Americans uh, were appealed to as a people, you know, by Roosevelt yeah. and by um, other leading Democrats. My joke about communism, uh, even in FDR's day, with these decidedly centrist programs, I mean, the Social Security Act is a centrist program, really, right? It's, it's regressive it's, tax, actually. It's regressive yeah, yeah. It's, uh, but he faced allegations of socialism, communism, you're going to destroy our capitalists. So... The New Deal, the ideas of the left, they, they eventually do run out of steam, uh, which happens with movements, right? It's sure. hard to maintain as an expert on political movements. I don't, I don't need to convince you on that one. Um, Vietnam, Watergate, the dollars of the late 1970s, it appeared that what we might call the left or the new left was out of ideas and was exhausted. And that gives way to the Reagan Revolution, which I guess couldn't overturn the New Deal by then, but was not going to allow any more liberal uh, reforms, liberal pieces. Of it. It, that was it, right? Draw the line. And we're kind of still living in that. I think that's world. true. And partly because we haven't had a majority party in this country, really, since right. the early 1970s, that's 50 right. years. You know? um, 
one party wins for a while and takes over Congress for a while, another takes over the Senate, another one takes over the House. This is much more like a period called the Gilded Age, late 19th century, where the two parties were very equal in strength. And when that happens, you're not going to have real um, big sort of forward movements of any great size or, or, or importance in policy. Um, uh, more, you're going to have tinkering around the edges. And as you say, uh, Ronald Reagan you know, was very popular uh, the last six years or so of his administration. But, uh, uh, but he didn't roll back Social Security uh, or Medicare. Uh, actually, he, he, uh, he was ran, hostile to civil his, his rights Congress as well. We had more of a deficit under him than it had under, under Carter because he increased the defense budget so That's much. Right. Uh, to, you know, so, I was going to say, he yeah. hostile, his administration was hostile to civil rights, too, but they didn't win many big battles Much there. Yeah, the King yeah. Holiday begins in 1983 yes. in, yes. Uh, during his time. The one thing he did do, and this is important, underline again as he did before, he was hostile towards labor unions, even though he had been a leader of a labor union when That's he was right. a liberal, the Screen Actors Guild right. back in Hollywood. But uh, when he broke this, the uh, air traffic control strike in 1980, a group of government workers who did not have the power legally to go on strike, but he decided instead of working with them, negotiating with them, he decided to fire them all for going on strike. Um, it was part of, because he knew that the labor unions had been, even when they were getting some weaker by 1980 from the way they had been during the New Deal, they were still the, the, the activist core of the Democratic Party. Um, and so by attacking labor unions, and Republicans are still doing that, they could really attack um, um, the, the most important uh, constituents uh, and organizations which help Democrats win. Yeah. So it was not just like the Republicans now attack teachers unions partly for that reason. Yeah, the word I was looking for before is no, no new liberal incursions uh, by the federal yeah. government is what they yeah. stopped. They couldn't overturn the New Deal, uh, try as they might. But And Obamacare was the first really big yes, one. Yes, that's true. Since, and since the, the, the 60s. He had enough of a majority to get that through for those two Barely. years and then lost it. Barely, yeah. um, also, trust in institutions damaged by Johnson, I, know, I remember you mentioned in your book how you couldn't stand Hubert Humphrey because he waved pom-poms for Johnson in the Vietnam War. Dump the hump was the <laughs> slogan, yes. So Vietnam, Watergate, um, we're still facing, I think, if you take the long view of American history over the, really since the 1960s, we're suffering from a crisis in trust in our institutions and in our government. That's why it's so hard to hold on to power and have a, a long-running majority. But with good reason. I mean, the government has and our institutions have in many ways failed people. We just got out of Afghanistan after 20 years. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Where, you know, maybe we shouldn't have been in the first place. But yes. uh, yeah, where's the anti-war yeah. left, actually? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> American power, yeah. both domestically and in terms of and power abroad, was obviously growing from, uh, actually, arguably, from World War I uh, through World War II into the Cold War. Um, and uh, the state was growing too, you know, the military industrial complex was big government, you know, of course, um, even though a lot of Republicans supported it. But I think uh, the loss in Vietnam, and it was a loss, uh, the fiscal crisis, um, the stagflation in the 1970s, um, also uh, was the first time uh, since the Great Depression when Americans began to wonder about the future and there was no big, huge boom that came after it really either. Um, and also inequality began to grow, something which uh, people on the left talk about a lot and yes. people around the country talk about too, whether uh, left or right these days. Uh, the, the gap between the rich and the poor, the gap between ordinary wage earners and hedge fund managers, uh, Jeff Bezos is the world and others, is much larger than it was uh, in the 40s and 50s and 60s and even 70s. And that, I think, leads to a sense of, uh, you know, the government talks about helping all Americans, but it's not doing anything about that. Um, so who really cares about us kind of, kind of question. You know? Haven't Democrats, in a sense, and you care deeply about the Democratic Party, they've lost their way on this issue. Um, at least some have. Well, uh, I, would, I would argue that, that their policies uh, mm -hmm. would actually, uh, reason why I'm a Democrat, mm -hmm. uh, a progressive Democrat. Yeah. Uh, we, I think their policies that Joe Biden is in favor of, yes. that uh, the Democratic Party officially is in favor before of, before Biden, is trying to pass. Well, before Biden was yes. some more difficult, yeah, yes. because Democrats again were concerned about winning, and they felt well if Ronald Reagan and both Bushes are winning presidential elections by, you know, sort of bashing unions to a certain degree, by trying to get end welfare as we know it, uh, by uh, you know being opposed to affirmative action, other liberal ideas about race. Maybe we should at least waffle on those issues as well. Um, uh, Dem Bill Clinton came out of a group called the Democratic Leadership Council, yes. which was a, a group that was formed explicitly to move the Democratic Party to the right, not because they were you know, right-wingers, 
but because they wanted to win. Yes. <laughs> um, so we'll wrap up as I, sure. I th thought we'd keep this to about an hour. Um, and boy, that went fast. But you know, it's that's well, what there's so many things left yes, to talk exactly. about. Yes, <laughs> exactly. We could spend the rest of our lives discussing this. Franklin Roosevelt is turning in his grave, or he would turn in his grave if somebody would have whispered to him how his party lost blue collar labor to Donald Trump. How did that happen? White blue collar labor. White blue collar labor. Important yes. to note yes. that. Uh, the Republicans People have made the some working class. The working class is not all white. In fact, it's getting right. less white over right. time. Uh, Republicans have made inroads with black voters a tiny bit. It's still but like 90, and Latino voters. And Latino more, voters, more, which yeah. is probably more, even more concerning to Democrats. But for the most part, you're right. Uh, African Americans still vote 90 plus percent. Latinos like two, two to one still. Yeah, two to one. Yeah. But white blue collar labor, an important constituency, yep. feels. Um, and we can get into this whole debate about how did, well, why did Trump win? Was it racial antagonism, class antagonism? But there are many white, blue-collar workers sure. who feel abandoned by the Democratic Party. Sure. And part of it is, is, is culture, yes. I think. Um, a lot of those workers are churchgoers. They feel like the Democratic Party is too secular a party. A lot of them also are you know, opposed to um, uh, abortion rights, you know, um, who were very religious, and that's important. And a lot of them also live away from big metropolitan areas and feel that the Democratic Party is this sort of party of urban elites, you know, or suburban elites, a uh, place like Bethesda, I mentioned before, um, very democratic and very rich suburb north of Washington, D.C. But also, I, again, not to harp on unionism, but I think when uh, unions were in the private sector, were very powerful institutions. Let's say 35% of all wage earners were in them. Uh, uh, that meant that they were places where people of different races, but especially white workers, would sort of get a political education. Uh, they would, you know, read new newspapers. They'd be talked to by by um, their shop stewards about why the Democrats are the party for union rights, for Medicare, uh, uh, for people getting out of poverty, and so forth. And and they also mobilized people to vote. So. Uh, people learn their politics from people close to them, I believe. Now, of course, people watch Fox or watch MSNBC or read the Washington Times or read the Washington Post. Yes, they, 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 get, they get politics from there, too. But in the end, who do you really trust about, about political opinions? It's usually people in your family, your friends, your work community, perhaps. Um, you don't want to be out of step with them. And when so many work, white workers were in unions, uh, in the Midwest especially, where unions were very strong back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, then those workers tended to vote Democratic. Yeah, well, those industries are gone. When, the, when, those, when they left, a lot of those people moved south also yeah. to get jobs, places like Texas, Louisiana, mm -hmm. um, Florida, uh, places that never had really strong unions. Yeah, uh, right to work. Places. That began to change. And one good example, I don't know if we have time, but yeah, I was pointing to West right. Virginia. West Virginia used to, on election night through uh, the early 1990s, was one of the first states called for Democrats. You know, uh, Michael Dukakis, 1988, who lost by eight points to George W. Bush. Nobody's idea of a populist, you know, no, no. figure of an Andrew Jackson or uh, um, Franklin Roosevelt either. Um, pretty awkward guy. He won West Virginia by 10 points. It was called right away. I, I remember watching that. election night. Why? And then now, you know, election night, it's called for, for Republicans. Yeah, and for Donald Trump, he won by 45 percentage points both times. Amazing. Why? Because the Union United Mine Workers used to educate um, people not just in the coal mine union, but outside the union, too, West Virginia, to vote for Democrats and why they should vote for Democrats. And now the United Mine Workers is like a fifth of its former size. That makes a big difference. Yeah. You, you discussed the organizational abilities of the party, how they created those quite a bit. In your book, What It Took to Win, A History of the Democratic Party. Michael Kazin, this has been fun. You are always welcome on the podcast. Thanks and very much, Martin. Since you're, it. you're in local, you know, now, now we can have you come in in studio now. You know, unless, I could be a weekly guest, you know. <laughs> <laughs> those, those would be long podcasts. <laughs> but congrats on your book, and thanks for coming here. Thank, Thank you, you everyone who's been listening and watching at WashingtonTimes.com. History As It Happens is available wherever you get your podcasts.